Hi there. Uh, so I'm Jack Clemens. I am a writer of both science fiction and science, not fiction. Um, and what I wanted to do today was read from a time travel short story that got published in Amazing Stories um, last year. It's a new, a new time travel story for me. And, um, so, and I wanted to spend a little time uh, reading from it and then we'll stop at a certain point and see what kind of questions we get. Okay. So the story is called Intruder. Um, it's, it's set in Washington, DC, February 11th, 1865. The alarm in Aaron Malik's inner ear chimed. The sound penetrated through his dreams like a diving bell, rousing him from a half glimpsed memories and dragging him to the surface. He pushed through to wakefulness, ignoring the chime for a moment, orienting himself in the darkness of his room. The dream was an old one, Sonia's smiling eyes swept away by a sudden and indifferent riptide. As always, he wondered which was memory and which was dream. How could that terrible day have already happened if it had yet to occur in a time still to come? Maybe it was just a nighttime fiction he'd conjured as a self-defense, an escape from the impossible existence of living in this recycled past. He found it hard to distinguish the two in the many fluid years that now described his life. The alarm continued to intrude, insistent on its attention. That, was, that at least was real, small enough anchor to focus on, and he acknowledged it. He closed his eyes, touched the tip of his tongue to a tooth. No, no visuals and short. It was a low power transmission, someone close by. Lines of green text painted the inside of his eyelids. It was Stevenson, one of his agents. <clears throat> O25 local, watcher at Stanton's, unknown but probable intruder, request authorization to interdict. Malik grunted. These incidents were becoming more frequent as April the 14th approached. He blinked to bring up the current time, 2.30. He considered his alternatives. Stevenson was new and a tad too officious. Malik's apartment was east of the Capitol, near C and 7th. He had selected this location to ensure that none of his War Department colleagues were likely to drop by on their way home from work. That meant he was many blocks away from Stanton's house. Still, he would need to investigate the intruder himself. He tongued another tooth and his fingertips described a series of small jerky movements in the empty air above his bed. Green letters strobed across his eyelid screen. Observe as required, do not detain, wait for my action, on my way. He reread the message, then tongued the switch to transmit it. Malik blinked his eyelids clear and closed them again, pushing off the fatigue that bore on him. He sat upright and swung his feet onto the floor in a single smooth moment. Probably some political hack hoping to spy out some advantage on the secretary, he thought, or just a burglar. This wouldn't be the first time Stevenson had overreacted. Malik dressed by the gaslight that seeped through his window from the street lamp outside. In 10 minutes, he was outside the building that served as his home. An icy wind sliced through the dark Washington, Washington streets, reaffirming the, cal the calendar's declaration of midwinter. There were no hacks around at this late hour. He would have to walk. Malik pulled the collar of his wool coat up around his ears and pushed his hands deep into his pockets. He hurried along the lengthy zigzag route to Stanton's home, partly out of urgency, but also to keep the cold at bay. This is exhausting, he thought. Two months to go and all hell's breaking loose and little things that were changed but not corrected, like the great dome of the Capitol building. It was woefully behind schedule 
an unexpected con contagion had slowed its work. Yet in his history, it had recorded it complete by Lincoln's second inaugural in less than a month. He can't hold this together by himself. Another 25 freezing ill-tempered Ill minutes passed before the three-story shadow of the Secretary of War Edwin Stanton's home looked out on the even darker night. Malik slowed to a walk. Stanton's house near, near Franklin Square was one of the few downtown that did not adjoin its neighbors. Near enough to the White House and the War Department, but removed from intruding eyes, it was that opportunity for proximity with isolation that attracted the secretary to the property. The house was a modern one, constructed a decade ago over the ashes of an unremarkable hotel. The hotel's foundation and the charred remains of its unfortunate occupants were all that had survived a not uncommon city fire. Tons of earth had been brought in by handcart to cover the hotel's corpse. Large trees were planted along the perimeter at great expense to further ensure Stanton's privacy. With characteristic eccentricity, Stanton had insisted that no gas lampposts were to intrude upon his domain. Stanton found darkness and ablution. He had built an anachronistic country mansion amid the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder brick facades of the nation's capital. Malik surveyed the house and its surroundings, looking for small signs of an intruder. He crossed the street that fronted on the property. A man stepped out from behind the shadow of a tree and approached him. Stevenson was one of the two meager and later arriving reinforcements that the Institute had begrudged him as the critical events approached. Malik's interactions with Stevenson had not been encouraging. Where is he? Malik asked the man. She, she went inside about five minutes ago. She watched the house before making her move. You're certain it's a woman? Absolutely, she was wrapped in a cloak and her movements were feminine. Malik sighed at the man's attitude. Many agents had floundered, some fatally, by making unwarranted assumptions. It was like, it was an unforgiving flaw for someone in, his, in this occupation. Who else is inside? Maybe that's his wife. No, the secretary's wife and family are away. Stanton's alone. And the servants? Stevenson hesitated. No, uh, no, no, no signs of anyone but the secretary. The fool hadn't checked the servants' quarters. The intruder might be an embarrassed maid slinking home from an, from an assignation. However, if the secretary's family was out of town, he must have dismissed the cook for the evening. Stanton did not like eating alone. He had a paranoid fear of choking and always wanted someone nearby. He would have taken his supper at the club. It was possible that Stanton was alone in the house tonight. That could have elicited a genuine intruder to pick this night to act. How long has the person been in there? Five minutes less, Stevenson answered. She waited and watched for a long time and then went in just before you arrived. And then he added, what's our plan? You can leave, I'll handle this alone. Stevenson flinched at the reproach. He nodded though, hesitating an instant, and turned and walked away. Malik's eyes na narrowed on the retreating man's back. Rash and impertinent, he thought. Not good traits in a field agent. He would request the man be cashiered in the morning. Malik dismissed Stevenson and turned his attention to the mansion. From where he stood, he could see no evidence of intrusion. He worked his way to the back of the house, pausing to listen for signs of, of alarm within or with, for the surreptitious movements of an accomplice standing guard in the shadows outside. Except for the distant barking of a dog and the irregular gusting of the wind, the night was silent. He stepped up onto the covered porch, then enclosed the rear entrance of the home. He turned the knob, the door was unlocked, not a good sign. The secretary would never leave his entrance as unguarded. The servants were well conditioned in this, to this mandate by the terrorizing Stanton inflicted on them in its breach. This pointed to an intruder. The person had acquired a key to avoid a forced entry. They had not, however, researched the secretary's habits well enough 
to know that they should lock the door again behind them. The intruder was careless and therefore an amateur and therefore more dangerous. Malik pulled the door open. Outside, the sky was clear and starlit, but in the interior of the house was black as a rat's burrow. Malik couldn't wait for his eyes to adjust. His opponent needed no further advantage. He touched a fingertip to the corner of his right eye and a transparent film descended over each pupil. He blinked once and the house went visible as if lighted by a new day sun. He inspected the large kitchen area. The pots and pans hung in soldierly rows, ranked by size, the size along the wall. The cooking utensils were arranged in neat files on crisp white linen on the countertop, all done to the secretary's requirements. There was no one in the room. Malik left the kitchen. He started down the front hallway's polished hardwood floor, his hand tracing the muted wallpaper. One side was a sloping half wall formed by the stairway that led up to Stanton's bedroom. Malik paused halfway down the hall and crouched low and out of sight of anyone ascending the stairs. He drew a Colt revolver from an inside pocket of his coat and started edging along again, peering through the balusters as the staircase revealed itself. Before he reached the foot of the stairs, he saw a small figure ascending to the upper landing. The intruders appear, intruder appeared to be a young woman. She had a slight figure and long dark hair that flowed across her shoulders from beneath a gauzy veil. She was dressed in white. Her full length gown was embroidered in fine lace and adorned with a silk train. She looked like a bride ascending to her bower. Her back was turned to Malik. She hadn't noticed him yet. Malik circled, circled to the bottom step and positioned himself for a clear shot. He shielded his body with a newel post and steadied the gun hand and steadied his gun hand on his cap. He aimed the colt at the woman's back and cocked the hammer. She froze at the sound. Neither of them moved for several, several seconds. He saw that she was considering her options, selecting a course of action that might regain her some advantage. She was unruffled. Steel nerves and calculating, another dangerous sign. He would have to kill her here if she didn't submit. His explanation to the secretary would require some inventiveness, but he would deal with that after. Of course, all that assumed that he could kill her. Who knows what she might be capable of? Her innocuous disguise shouldn't, full, shouldn't lull him. As the seconds passed without any movement, he grew more certain she was vulnerable. If she could have dispatched him, she would have already done so. She had the feel of an amateur about her. How many fanatics and madmen are out there? There seemed to be no end to those who would risk their own lives and everything around them rather than live in a world that they found repugnant. But with the date of John Wilkes Booth's act at Ford's Theater approaching, the number of troublemakers had swollen from a trickle to a torrent, and it was bound to get worse. The woman splayed her fingers and spread her hands in a gesture of surrender. She turned around. She was young, plain of face, but not homely. From the way she stared at him, Malik was certain she was using night-assisted vision as well. Malik recognized her, but it's obvious she did not recognize him. Good, she did, do all, did not do all of her homework. He backed away from the newel post, keeping it between his body and hers. It was scarce protection against a weapon. He gestured with the pistol for her to descend. She glanced back at the large double doors that led to Stanton's rooms, now just beyond his, her reach. Then she stared down at Malik again. He jerked the colt more emphatically this time. The woman reached for the railing and started to descend. Malik continued to, re to retreat, maintaining the distance between them. He was alert for small movements, any sign she was ready to strike. He kept the pistol pointed at her eyes, guessing that was where she was the most vulnerable. She reached the bottom of the stairs and stopped again. What do you mean by barging in here? She snorted. Who are you? Though her tone was abrupt, she had whispered the demand. Outside, he whispered back. 
Our money is in the safe and I don't have the key. She gestured toward a diamond necklace suspended in two tiers around her throat. You can have my jewelry, just go away and leave us alone. Her reluctance to cause a disturbance re reinforced his belief that she was an interloper. Outside, he said again. This time he allowed his own fury to show in his face. The woman's head jerked with her surprise. She came around the banister, keeping her face always turned to his. Uh, when <laughs> she reached the hallway, she, st she stood still again, facing him. He pointed past her with the barrel. She backed down the hallway toward the kitchen, her hands groping at the walls, never taking her eyes off of Malik. She was studying his face now, trying to read his intentions. She seemed unsettled, unsure of herself. Her eyes lost some of their cockiness. He didn't relax his vigilance. He saw no fear in her face, and her eyes flashed once in what might have been anger. She started to speak, but thought better of it. Her eyes slitted toward the colt. Good. When they reached the back door, he motioned her aside. He held the colt's barrel to her eyes and reached past her to turn the knob. It swung open, and the woman glanced over her shoulder at the black knight framed in the doorway. She looked at him again, her eyes questioning, as he pointed the pistol at the door. She proceeded him out onto the porch, still backing up. When Malik closed the door again, she decided to make her next move. She dropped her hands to her side, drew herself up, and her face pinched into an indignant scowl. This is far as I shall go, sir. If you mean to do me harm, you will have to do it here. Who are you, Malik said. Who am I? How dare you subject me to such an impertinence? I said, who are you, Malik snapped. He leveled the cold at her. Why, sir, I am a cousin of the man who lives in this house. What business is that of yours? Malik slapped her face with his open hand. She started to shriek, but strangled it. She covered her cheek with her hand. She was trying hard not to make noise. Her mouth dropped open as if she were in shock, but no tears had formed in the corners of her eyes. Malik held the pistol to her face again. Face again. Do you sleep in your wedding dress? He raised the colt higher as if meaning and he meant to strike her with it, and she shied. She didn't answer. Good. Either she's capable of feeling pain or she's hoping to maintain her charade with me until she can get some advantage. Turn around and walk ahead of me, he ordered. Where are you taking me? This time he didn't answer. Sir, it's bitterly cold. I'll take my death unless I get my wrap. She shrugged her arms to her chest and stared out to the dark as if she, uh, as if she dreaded descending into it. Malik looked at her bare upper arms. Though she was shivering, there were no goosebumps on her flesh. She glanced, glanced back at him, saw him looking at her arms, and her face went blank. Turn around and walk ahead of me, Malik said. Don't speak again unless I tell you to. The woman's eyes flared, but she turned and descended the two steps that led to the frozen lawn. Malik shrugged his coat around his shoulders and thrust his free hand inside the pocket. With the other, he held the pistol straight out and pointed at the back of the woman's head. She gave up her pretense and stopped, stomped on ahead of him, erect now and confident and unperturbed by the freezing gust that pulled at her long hair like invisible combs. This is a bad turn, Malik thought. She knew he had penetrated her disguise, so she had no further reason to deceive him. The fact that she had not attacked could only mean she was worried about the cold, so he had that advantage. She was planning her counterattack, waiting for some weakness or distraction, but she was demonstrating her contempt for him now. He slowed a bit, letting her open an additional step on him. If I didn't need to question her, I'd kill her right now. That's it. Good stopping point. I do, yeah. Story Leaves is about to hear more. Pardon me? Leaves us wanting to hear more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a the story is about twice that length, I guess, and it in turn is a, a, a story, a separate story that is 
uh, part of this larger book that I have written. It's actually now got my um, agent passing around called Over Old Ground, which is about people that go back to change the Lincoln assassination and all the things that come with it. And obviously uh, my guy is a little um, perturbed to be back there trying to prevent all that bad stuff from happening. So which issue, uh, where, where can we find that story? Amazing stories, uh, volume seven, issue one, that was from last year. And uh, just, to, and like September, October, I think, of last year. Yeah, the fall of 2019, it was labeled. Mm -hmm. It was published in there. Uh, and the author, you know, uh, uh, Amazing Stories also goes to some trouble to put together images for those books. And so this. Is oh, very nice. Yeah, isn't that neat? That they put together. I love it. I have a picture of that on my ceiling up there somewhere. There it is, way up, way up there above my, above the Lincoln picture. Yeah, I was going to ask, is the Lincoln picture associated with this work or related? Yeah, uh, this particular book has come, out, come together in pieces. Uh, I wrote a book, a, a short story for um, Amazing Stories of All Things some time ago called Will Little, Will Little Note No Long Remember? And it's about a guy who goes back to try to stop the assassination. Um, and it did pretty well. It was, it was reprinted several times. Um, and then later on, I had, when I was talking to my agent, he said, why don't you turn that into a novel? And he and I had that conversation about, oh, I don't know, this <laughs> 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he had contacted me through the pit and said, oh, I'd love to represent you. So I kept sending him, you know, versions of it. He kept saying, no, not fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. So we went a long, long time um, before I could get him something he was fa fairly happy with. Um, but as part of that, this story that I just read was originally in that collection. And he said, you need to take that out. It's, it's interesting, but it's a standalone story. So then I said, well, okay, then I can publish it. And so Steve, so now Steve's got both ends of my, of my book published and the rest of it's, you know, hopefully it will happen this year. If something is good, it's worth selling twice. <laughs> or more. Or more, yeah. It was foreign editions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. do you have anything uh, coming out uh, in the next few months that we should be looking out for? Uh, well, over so... My agent, I, my agent, and his representatives is, uh, they have been. They sent it around to all the publishers in New York. Yeah, he's a New York agent, and he's had some hits, and people are interested in it and they're reading it. So he keeps sending me notes and said, you know, it hasn't been that long. Yeah, just wait, just wait. Um, but with any kind of luck, yeah, it should. I don't know about coming out, but it should get a publisher. I hope in the next dear God several weeks. <laughs> I hope month maybe. And then from that, they'll have a date when they want to, yeah. Any um, short fiction? Pardon me, short fiction, this was the most recent. I have a bunch of others, of it, but this was it. And then I have a book that I wrote about the space program that, 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 that is out. I mean, I've, oh, I had, oh yeah, I worked on the Apollo space program and the space shuttle program back in the day and was there for all the Apollo missions and the shuttle missions. And so at the same agent who was trying to get this one sold, they had, like I said, a relationship for a long, long time. And he was said, uh, it was probably seven or eight years ago. He said, look, why don't you write about the time on the space program? He said, maybe I could sell that one. And so actually I was already working on it with Steve Davidson. I was putting, I was putting parts out there. I was trying, I had all my, you know, when you work on those programs, you don't forget it. I saved everything. So I had all those notes and everything and I was putting it together. And those formed the basis of the book I put the larger thing together. Steve was really good. He gave me all kind. Of, of course, I had it was by the time I got it published, I had it, you know, I had to be unique to me. It could be published somewhere else. And Steve had a lot of those of those episodes. So Steve just said he left the space and he said, if you want if you want to see this link anymore, here's Jack's here's how you get Jack's book, which was nice. Um, and then yeah, he got me a publisher. They put me through the thing. We wrote it several times. And I got it, I was uh, published at the end of 2018. The uh, title? 
uh, safely to Earth, the men and women that brought the astronauts home. And it's basically a memoir of my time on the program. And, it, and, it, and um, I have to say it's done very well. It's, it's still you know, hard, hard copy print, still doing very well. I picked up a copy, I think it was at the, uh, the San Diego World Con. I think I saw you giving a talk, uh, reading an excerpt from it there. Yeah, that was it. So, yeah, endorsed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've been happy. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't know. It's just that the, that, that whole world had not, there are a lot of stories about the astronauts and that, about mission control, but there was like this world below, and I was a contractor under support to NASA. Um, there's not that much about, well, what was it like being on that level? And so I had all those notes, but I also had all those contacts. I had, I had stayed in touch with a lot of people I worked with, both at NASA and on the program. They contributed to it. So it turned out to be sort of a, you know, if you want to see what the larger world is like, I can't tell you that from, a, from this point of view, but I can tell you what it was like working on this. And that gave you some insight into what it was, what all of us were doing at that level. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was well received. I was happy about that. It's like I said, it, it's the, it has, they get, I got an advance from my uh, publisher on it, which was, I mean, from my, my agent had, had, uh, had, um, negotiated a, 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 an advance for me. Uh, and, but it just stays. They, the publisher usually goes hardbound and softbound and then come and get it. And this thing stays, has stayed in hardbound, even on Amazon, it's just still stay there. There's a, there's a, um, audiobook version of it now. It's fascinating. Although I, I listen to the audio version of it, can't stand it. I listened to it a couple of times and you can hear how I talk. And they go, when I first came to work for NASA, I was new at this job. I thought, oh my God, I couldn't stand it. So I've never listened to it. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to, I guess I'll take over and start reading. My name is Jim Cambius. Uh, my latest novel is out from Bain this February, which seems like 20 years ago at this point. Um, it's called The Initiate, and this is a fantasy novel. Um, but uh, what I'm going to be reading today is uh, my work in progress, the next book which has the, uh, the working title, um, uh, the, Gödel op the Gödel Operation, a, a story of the billion worlds. And it takes place a, a considerable time in the future. Uh, so I'll just begin with part one, the imaginary girlfriend operation. Chapter one. Here's how it all happened, or at least how I currently remember it. You might want to keep that in mind. At the tag end of the 10th millennium, I lived in a habitat called Rabbah in the Uranus trailing Trojans. It was an old rock and ice asteroid, all honeycombed with tunnels, with a big rotating habitat cylinder stuck on for the meat people. I was living in a cheap little spider bot body at the time and earned my honest living in the water mines keeping the big stupid drill bots running despite their energetic efforts to wreck themselves. Nanotech refiners are all very well, but at some point you have to grind stuff up for them, and that means big stupid machines made of iron and graphene. Our three idiots were named Aben, Becca, and Chiadi. My partner was a human named Z. Pretty clever for a lump of meat. He never complained about getting the harder physical work while I did the tasks fit for my superior knowledge and precision. I'd go into the guts of our idiot charges to make repairs, while Z pried chunks of hard rock out of the drill heads or chipped frozen slush out of the treads. He didn't pickle his meat brain with chemicals, and he didn't need me to tell him what to do all the time, so I worked with him for a couple of years, which meant I got a bit worried when he started going wrong. At first, it just looked like regular meat laziness. The quality of his work declined. He started coming in late and knocking off early, and his rest breaks got longer and longer. Then he started getting cranky, snapping back when I made perfectly reasonable suggestions and identified problems for him. I could live with that. You have to put up with a lot of stupid meat nonsense if you live in a mixed hab like Rabba. I've seen worse. But then he started getting sloppy, making stupid mistakes, being careless. I knew what that was leading up to, a lump of dead meat cooling off in vacuum. Always a bother, 
and I didn't want to see that happen to Z. So I did what most sentient beings since prehistory have done in situations like that. I asked God for help. The God of Rabba is a pretty typical example of the breed. It ran the weather, sometimes made the ground shake, laid out a code of behavior for people to follow and punished the wicked. Also managed the ecosystem and kept the lights on. Fortunately for all of us inside the Hab, Rabbi didn't go in for incarnating in unconventional forms to impregnate the local hotties, nor did it get too picky about things to eat or where the meat people put their gametes. It didn't demand sacrifices, didn't sell indulgences, and didn't threaten to flood the place out of peak, so we all put up with it like we had a choice. I sent in my prayer via wireless link, and to my surprise, I got a personal response. Rabba manifested in my sensorium, taking the form of an emperor penguin in a top hat. Well, the penguin asked, what's the problem? My partner's unhappy. It's affecting his work. So find a new partner. He's getting careless. He's going to kill himself at this rate. He's one of your meat people. You should be concerned. The penguin shrugged. He's worth exactly one of my baseline equivalent intelligence population. I've got half a million others. I think that's the problem. Z knows he's unimportant. He's just one of a quadrillion bio machines for turning food into shit, and he's smart enough to realize it. I think it bothers him. What do you want me to do about it? The penguin asked. I don't know. You're the third level super intellect. I'm just a humble baseline mind. Of course you are. The penguin somehow managed to smirk, then nodded. Tell you what. I'll fix his brain, pull him in for a medical exam, fiddle with his memories, and leave him thinking his life has meaning. That doesn't sound very ethical, I pointed out. The penguin shrugged again. Sure it is. It's a medical treatment. He'll be happier afterward. I don't want you messing with his personality. He doesn't deserve that. Too bad. You're the one who brought this to my attention. You certainly aren't going to stop me. Oh, what if I tell him you've been messing with the goop inside his skull? You won't. I started to feel some imperatives trying to slip into my mind, so I blocked them. Rabba and I sparred for a few picoseconds before it gave up. I'm too old and cunning for that kind of dust, I told the penguin. You're still not going to tell him anything. If you start telling secrets to meet, I can do it too. Do you really want to start down that path? bastard. The answer to that question was no in big flaming letters. I guess I have to say okay now so we don't waste another 10 nanoseconds in pointless argument. But if you mess up his personality, I won't care what you tell him. Remember that. The penguin smirked again, then vanished. Two days later, Z left work halfway through our normal shift. I've got a medical check. What for? Nothing. I mean, I just got a reminder. I think it's just a routine scan. I'm really sorry about this. Maybe we can make it up by doing some extra hours tomorrow. Don't worry. I'll just finish up the shift on my own. He looked even more unhappy. That's not safe. What if something happens to you? I'll be okay. I've been doing this longer than you have by about two orders of magnitude. Okay, okay. But at least ask the main mind to check in with you at intervals. That way, if you miss a contact, it'll know something's wrong. Relax, Z. I keep backups. Even if my body somehow got disintegrated, I'd just lose a day's memories. That was actually a lie. I didn't leave copies of myself lying around where snoops like the penguin could read them. I preferred the risk of final death to having someone else picking through my memories. But my little fib seemed to reassure Z, and he gave me a cheery mock salute as he headed off to get brainwashed. I actually did knock off early that day. In fact, I waited precisely long enough for Z to get out of sight and then followed him out of the mine. He pushed through the pressure membranes into the air section where he ditched his work suit and walked through a cloud of nanobots to clean off some of the horrifying gunk and living things from his skin. Then he tapped his neckband and extruded a set of red and gold tights to simultaneously hide and draw attention to his meat body. He went through the adapter into the rotating hab and headed directly for the nearest clinic. I changed my external color from my normal safety green to a more inconspicuous dark gray and followed him. 
outside the clinic, I lurked under a bench with all my limbs folded up. Three hours later, Z came out of the clinic looking very vague. He stared around uncertainly for nearly a minute before heading for his apartment. I followed him to his front door and then got on the link to Raba. The penguin let me stew for 30 long seconds before responding. Is there an emergency you wish to report, citizen? It asked, cocking its head to watch me with one beady penguin eye. What did you do to him? Wipe everything? I'm sorry, it would be unethical of me to reveal details of someone's medical treatment, said the penguin. But you can relax. I didn't remove any memories or tinker with his personality. A good night's sleep should fix any lingering effects of the procedure. He'll be fine tomorrow. You'll see. It vanished before I could ask anything else and didn't respond to my pings after that. Gods can be jerks that way. I hung around outside Z's apartment until morning and accidentally happened to be passing by just as he emerged for that day's work shift. He looked a lot more alert and focused than he had the previous afternoon, and we chatted as we made our way to the mine. He seemed normal, and at work his performance was much more like his old style. I couldn't identify any specific change to his personality, but at the same time I couldn't shake the nagging suspicion that he had been changed somehow. The penguin, of course, said nothing. In my quest to figure out what Rabba had done to Z's brain, I wound up spending a lot more time with him. We actually went out socializing together and met some of his meat friends. They were an unexceptional bunch, mostly humans and chimps, with a couple of angels who dropped by from time to time. The primary bond among them was a devotion to the combat sport of Nulles Grima, zero-gravity stick fighting. I remember watching that style of combat get invented back in the aftermath of the devastating fourth millennium. A quarter of the habitats in the system were lifeless hulks, hit by kill vehicles or the monster lasers of the inner ring cabal. All that mass and tech floating around gave birth to the golden age of the junk rats. They developed their stick fighting techniques during centuries of desperate battles in the dark passages and empty spaces of wrecked habs and spaceships. I once watched four junk rats hold off a whole company of lunar mercenaries in a ruined section of Earth's geosync ring using nothing but carbon fiber rods and ceramic knives. Then the refined gentleman of sixth millennium Deimos turned it into a sport, gave it a fancy new name and slathered on rules and ritual like it was radiation shielding. That lasted a few centuries until the sport died out, got revived and mutated into a performance art set to music. <laughs> a couple of millennia later, political clubs in the old belt took up Nulles Grima and used it to great effect in the rebellions against the post-human oligarchies. For most of the ninth millennium, every political demonstration worth the name in an asteroid habitat had to include some athletic looking characters waving palos. Nowadays, it's gone back to being a sport. Meanwhile, real junk rats continue trying to murder each other with sticks and knives like they always have. About a month after his medical appointment, Z and I were watching a chimp named Maki battle an angel called Dana. The angel was obviously more used to mace fighting as she kept trying big haymaker swings, which merely propelled Maki around the empty storage bay they were using as an arena. The chimp could use his palo to bounce back, then quickly swing it around to attack with all his momentum behind it. Only the fact that Dinah could fly out of the way saved her from some nasty impacts. While we watched them bounce and dodge, Z cleared his throat a couple of times and finally spoke. Daslak, I've been wondering, have you ever done something you really regretted? A couple of things, I said, more like a couple of billion things, but he certainly didn't need to know that. Have you ever tried to make it right, change what you've done? No, that was perfectly true. There are some things one simply can't fix, and I've had to devote a lot of my attention to simple survival. I wondered exactly what the penguin might have told Z during his medical treatment, but of course I didn't ask. He was silent as we watched Dana grab Maki's palo with her feet and try to fling him off, but a chimp's hands can grip just as hard as an angel's feet, so the two of them tumbled in midair. Dana made the mistake of spreading her wings to slow them, which brought Maki swinging around to kick her in the back of the head. That scored him the winning point, and the two of them saluted before clearing the space so another pair of fighters could face off. 
What have you ever done to have regrets about? I asked Z as a pair of novice human noladors took up their two meter palos and launched themselves into the center of the bay. We watched the two newbies shoot past each other, ricochet off the walls and miss each other again. The others watching hooted at that. Z shook his head, but I couldn't tell if he was shaking it at the sorry spectacle overhead or at his own <laughs> thoughts. He must have realized how he looked. I was thinking about Kusti, he said. Who? He looked at me, surprised. Oh, I guess that was before you and I started working together. I was just a kid, really. Kusti was aboard a trading ship that stopped off here for a couple of weeks. We fell in love. First time for either of us. Then she had to leave. I wanted to stay, so she left. What's to regret? I asked. I was selfish, he said. I refused to leave Raba. But now that I think about it, I don't really love this place all that much. I could have gone with her. I should have. I guess I was just being stubborn. I see, I said. Do you think it's too late to fix things with her? You said she left. She could be anywhere by now. I'll send out an autonomous message to track her down. It may be too late, I pointed out. She may have found someone else. Meanwhile, I was desperately trying to get in touch with the penguin. The bastard waited nearly five seconds before replying. Are you in danger or distress, citizen? It asked. Who is Kusti? All of a sudden, he's talking about this old lost love he's never mentioned before. Did you put her in his head? He needed something to give his life meaning. I gave him a tragic love story. My model showed an 85% likelihood that it would solve his problem. Oh, well, listen to this, oh, great and wise third-level mind. I linked the penguin to my senses in real time, in time to hear Z's response. I feel like I should apologize to her, tell her I'm sorry for being selfish. I behaved like a jerk, and she deserved better, said Z. Well, now, said the penguin inside my mind. That's a low probability result. Is this Kusti person real? She's going to be getting mail from Z pretty soon. Kusti Sendoa is the love interest in a first-person virtual entertainment called Brief Eternity, produced at Amphimactus in the early 7100s. I just tinkered with some of the specifics to match Z's personal experiences and picked the bittersweet ending. He's lucky I didn't use the one where she dies. <laughs> so what are you going to do about it? Why should I do anything? He'll send out an autonomous message. It might even find someone with the right name. If it gets past her filter agents, she'll read it and either dump it in the trash or tell Z he's got the wrong person. I suppose it's theoretically possible that the recipient might play along and try to pretend she's the one he fell in love with, but what are the odds of that? I don't want to see Z unhappy, but I can't keep myself from hoping this all blows up in your face, I told the penguin. At the same time, I said to Z, don't beat yourself up about it. You said you were both young. I've noticed that young humans often assign far too much importance to their early relationships. He laughed at that. Maybe so, but he turned serious again. I've never felt anything as intense as what I had with her. I can't even remember anything else that happened during those two weeks. It's as if nobody existed but the two of us. I think you may have embedded the memories a little too intensely, I told the penguin. A deliberate choice. It's supposed to be the most vivid experience of his life. Whenever he starts to think about how pointless his existence is, he can look back on that brief eternity of romance. You're quoting promotional text from that game, aren't you? The penguin just winked at me and then vanished. I concentrated my attention on Z again. Well, good luck, I told him. The two novices finished up their bout and Z put on his protective helmet and grabbed his graphene palo. Do you mean with Kusti or with Boar? He nodded at his opponent, a long-limbed young human taking his place on the other side of the bay. Both. I watched the two of them launch at each other and get into a tangle of sticks and limbs in the middle of the bay. Boar tried to choke hold with his palo, but Z kept his own stick along his body and so could lever Boar's away from his neck, get himself free, and put Boar into a spin as they drifted apart. The kid was good enough to soak up his angular momentum by twirling his palo, then gyroscoped himself around to kick Z. But Z got his own knee up to absorb the blow and the impact sent both of them off to the walls of the bay. Bohr had to flatten himself against the wall to get rid of all his residual spin, but Z used his own stick to bounce off and aim directly at Bohr like a man torpedo. 
The kid got out of the way and couldn't score a hit before Z bounced away again. The two of them launched into the center again, and the kid extended his own palo at arm's length, trying to use his reach to score a hit on Z and bounce away. Z managed to parry, causing both of them to spin in place. He pulled his own stick in close to rotate faster and get in a swing at Boar. Z canceled his own rotation by hitting the kid, scoring a point, then followed it up with a couple of rapid jabs. Three points, and the match was over. The two of them saluted and set the soles of their feet together to push apart and clear the space for the next bout. See you tomorrow, I told Z, and headed for the exit while the next two were getting into position. That seems like a good enough place to stop. We're almost at our wow. time. Wow. Is, is this book it has been published? No, it's, uh, I'm nearly finished writing it and intend to hand it in in the next couple of weeks. Wow, wow, wow. And this was how much, this is chapter one, how long is it? Um, it's gonna be somewhere in the 90 to 100,000 word range. I tend to write short. People always tell me, oh, you need to put more stuff in, so it may grow. Good. It's terrific. But, and it's under contract to Bain, so. Oh, good, good, good. Congratulations, that's wonderful. It's wonderful. So and also uh, a, lot of, a lot of homework going into doing all the research there, huh? Oh yes, but I love that part. And I would be lying if I said I didn't. You know, I'm perfectly happy to spend an afternoon wasting time doing like orbital calculations to <laughs> get something right because I've accepted the fact that I have to do that. My wife liked it, you see her. Yes, I see. In the chat, um, he's downstairs closed, closing off, so she can have a separate. You know, she she's not across from me here. She's downstairs with Lechi. Right. Well, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, you can do them in chat or raise your hand, and I'll unmute you or something. For either of us. I didn't really have any questions, but I really enjoyed both of the readings that you two did. Oh, well, very Thank glad you. to hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if that's it, um, um, Jack, is there anything else you want to, uh, puff before we sign off? No, I, I, other than I think, uh, the, what's happening here with the, with the con is wonderful. Uh, there's a terrific lineup of talent, a lot of really, really interesting, um, stories and, and, uh, readings and, and, um, we're gonna, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, events. Events, yeah. I was trying to think of workshops, they're calling them. Yeah. Yeah, it um, sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. It's okay. terrific. It's a terrific thing and, and pulled it back. Oh, and Denise is saying she meant to ask when your new book will be available. Oh, okay. Um, the the next book i'm not sure because i haven't handed it in yet obviously it hasn't got an official publication date but i imagine it will be 2021 i don't know specifically though you know they haven't they're not stupid they're not going to put it on the schedule until they have the manuscript in hand yeah what what about your previous books um so i have um i, I wrote um two novels for tor uh, my first book was called a darkling sea and my second book was called um, Corsair. And um, Darkling Sea is probably the one that I'm best known for. It's been, it's been reprinted in several different languages. Um, um, and it's a first contact story set on a ice covered world, kind of like Europa. And uh, Corsair was a near future techno thriller about real life or hard science space pirates. And um, uh, then my uh, third book was my first one for Bain, and it was uh, called Arcad's World, which is a story of a young human boy growing up as the, the only human on a world with lots of different aliens living on it. Um, and then my, uh, my most recent like book is a, 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 a way. It was like what? It's a little bit like the book you're writing now. <laughs> right? Well, in a way, <laughs> although this one is not a coming of age story. Yeah. Um, this one, this setting, I've uh, I've basically had a lot of fun creating, and I've used it for a couple of works of short fiction as well as the uh, the novel that I'm doing. Um, one of them is 
a short story coming out in a, a small press anthology called Retellings from the Inner Seas from, um, I think the publisher is Candlemark and Gleam. The editor is, is um, Athena Andreadis. And it's basically science fiction stories based on Mediterranean mythology. Ooh. So I popped one of them down into my 10th millennium. Um, it looks like it's time. Ira is saying it's time. So I guess it's time for us to sign off. I enjoyed your, your story and I'm, I'm going to see if I can hunt up a copy to see how it comes out. Well, thank you very much. The amazing stories will be glad to get you on. <laughs> and okay. Thanks to everyone for coming. And um, I guess we, uh, we just sign off, right?